thing about private equity, it is a bubble. It is absolutely a bubble. It's one of the biggest bubbles of all time. It's hard to communicate that to people because it is opaque, but it is absolutely a bubble. Private equity is reaching deeper and deeper into the economy. Equity firms are buying smaller and smaller businesses because they have more money than they can invest. And this could be setting the U.S. economy up for another crisis on the scale that we saw in 2008 and 2009, which was explained in the excellent book and movie, The Big Short. My friend Jared Gillian, author of the investment letter Street Freak, joins us today to discuss why all of us should care about what's happening in private equity, even if we're not private equity investors. He thinks private equity is the next big short. I'm Ed D'Agostino, and this is Global Macro Update. Hey, Jared, it's good to see you. We are here to talk about private equity, which is something you've been writing a lot about. And I want to walk through your entire thesis today about private equity, both the risks and the opportunities, uh, because they're both big. But to make sure we don't lose anybody right off the bat, can we just start out with the basics? What is private equity, basically? Okay, I mean, it sounds complicated, but it's actually very simple. So you have public companies, which are listed on a stock exchange, and private companies, which are private and you can't buy them. Something like a mutual fund is an investment company that buys up a bunch of stocks, builds a portfolio of stocks, and holds them over time, kind of passively. Uh, a private equity fund buys up a bunch of private companies and holds them as a portfolio, but doesn't really hold them passively. Uh, they're actively involved in management. And what they try to do is get rid of inefficiencies and increase profitability. Um, and over a period of about three or five years, um, they will eventually hopefully sell those private companies in an IPO or to another firm at a higher valuation. So that's basically how it works. Or at least that's how it used to work. That's how it's supposed to work. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so some of these companies are pretty big, right? Some of them are probably household names, uh, especially if you're interested in, in investing and, and finance. Can you run through maybe some of the, some examples of private equity groups? Blackstone is the biggest. Um, I want to say they have like 180 billion market cap or something like that. Um, KKR is big, TPG, Apollo. I would say those are the big four. Uh, and then you have some other ones that focus on private credit, which are a little smaller, like Aries. Um, but those are publicly traded private equity firms. The vast majority of them are not. The vast majority of them are closely held. Uh, and as I've said before, there are 17,000 private equity firms in the United States. And the vast majority of them have less than $1 billion under management. Okay, So they're pretty small. But altogether, the, the entire industry has trillions under management. Going back early into my career, like 25 years ago, I was uh, at a small brokerage and uh, we catered to private equity groups. We, we, were, we did private mergers and acquisitions and um, my, my buyer base was private equity and they were the smaller private equity groups that you, that you just mentioned. Um, and they were great to work with. And they were, they were, the people at these firms are super smart. Uh, a lot of them had had real deep, specific industry experience. So if you were looking at a, a metal manufacturing company, they had people internally that had deep experience in metal manufacturing. And if you were looking at a, a tech company, or that was back back in the ISP heyday, right? You, they, they had people in each of these industries that could come in and, and add value to the company and make the company better when they bought it. And that's what you point out has changed today. The old model was you buy a, you buy a company if you're a private equity group, right? And you try to improve it and make it bigger. And then you sell it either in an IPO or um, for the clients that I worked with, they would sell it to a bigger private equity group or a strategic investor. So somebody that was already in the industry and just wanted to do an add on acquisition. Can you talk a little bit about what's happened in the last five to 10 years, what that exit strategy now looks like? 
or doesn't look like? Well, I mean, exits have basically gone to zero. Like, you know, the the ability to take a company public has been decreased significantly. Um, there really haven't been any IPOs this year. There haven't been IPOs in a while. Um, a, a, an IPO used to be a very common exit, right? You would uh, buy a company when it was private, and then you would take it public. Uh, that hasn't happened in a long time for reasons really that are unrelated to private equity, right? Um, but there's a limited appetite for another firm to buy a private equity owned firm when the valuations are so high, right? Because these companies are no longer being bought at four or five times earnings. They're being bought at 10 or 12 times earnings and to resell them at a higher valuation is almost impossible um, so it's greatly reduced the number of exits available to private equity groups. And as a result, it has resulted in less cash being distributed to shareholders, LPs and the funds, right? And that is, that is really the biggest concern because if you're an LP, if you're an endowment or something like that, and you have 30% of your portfolio in private equity, and it's not spitting out in any cash, and you don't really know what it's worth, then that's a problem. Yeah, and 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 it's sort of contributed to what has led private equity to get so big, and to start investing in things that maybe they shouldn't be investing in. Well, I mean, I kind of get the impression that you know, private equity has become, and this is really more of a cultural statement, but private equity has become the place to be for young investment banking analysts, right? Like nobody really wants to work at a bank anymore; they want to work at a private equity firm, and the pay is better, and the hours are better. So um, it, it, what that's resulted in is people running companies with really no industry experience whatsoever. Like you use this example, the metals manufacturer, and you had people with experience specific to metals manufacturing. That doesn't really happen anymore. You have a 33-year-old uh, VP who's put in charge of a company, and typically the reflex is they fire a bunch of people and they raise prices, right? And that's what they do every single time. That's the formula that private equity uses. They lay off a third of the company and they raise prices. Everything gets worse. But in the short term, in the short term, like on a three or five year basis, you can extract more value out of the company. But really over the long term, you're hurting it, right? And I think one of the reasons that private equity is failing nowadays is because of this mismatch in time horizon between the founder of the company and a private equity owner. The founder of the company wants it to be around forever, right? Like they're, they want to satisfy customers. They want to keep customers as happy as possible because they plan on being in business forever. The private equity owner doesn't care. They're only going to be in business for three to five years. So they have a different objective, which is to extract as much money out of this business as possible. That ties in with one of my favorite terms in investing and finance, right? One of the one of the biggest negative terms in investing is financial engineering. And and private equity, they are the kings of financial engineering. Let's let's talk a little bit about how they structure a deal these days because first and foremost, they use a ton of debt Right. You, you said that they're different than than your typical owner, um, the, the family that started the business. Uh, but these guys come in and the first thing they do is they leverage it. No, that's absolutely true. And I think broadly speaking, um, there is so much leverage in the world of private equity. You know, the reason you and I are sitting here talking about this today is because of the systemic risks that this poses. Right. And. You know, I've t I've called this the big short 2.0. You know, one of the reasons the big short was the big short was because the massive amounts of leverage involved, the massive amounts of debt in the system. And the same is true of private equity. When a private equity firm buys a company, they typically borrow money to do it, right? So they borrow a bunch of money and then there's leverage on top of leverage. And there's just an enormous amount of debt within the system. And that's the problem. So how does a private equity group make money? Well, they, they do it a couple of ways. One, they do it in capital gains, right? 
So if you can buy a company at X and sell it at 2X, then they have a capital gain, right? So that's that's the most obvious way. And two is from income, cash flows of the business, right? And any cash flows that they might have along the way. So those are really the two ways that they do it. So that's that that kind of shines a light on one of the ways that it's different. And I, and what I'm trying to get to is I'm trying to really show people why they should care about this. The everyday person should really care about this problem. One, because it's getting to be big enough that it might actually be a risk to the entire financial system, as you point out. Two, um, they might work for a company that gets acquired by a private equity group and they might get fired right? because because that's what they do. Not all of them. There's actually number three. And number three is you're the founder and the owner of a company and you're getting close to retirement and you're thinking about selling. And if you sell today, you can sell at a huge valuation. But if you wait three or five years after private equity implodes, then you're going to get half as much money. Right. Exactly. And, and you talked about the exit strategy, like they can make capital gains when they, they buy a company, they fix it up, they improve it, and then they can sell it for more money than they paid capital gain. That's, that's capitalism. That's a good thing. Right. But there's a different strategy that they also can take, right? They can also load the company up with debt. They can extract fees, exorbitant fees from the company while they run it. And then once they get to a point where, where they've reached their target IRR, and I have a story for you about IRR, but their internal rate of return, once they reach that, if the company goes under, they might not care. They might just let it go under. Just you know, very different than if you and I got together, formed a company, borrowed some money, um, and, and bought a business, right? We would, we would work until our knuckles were bloody to, to keep that company alive and, and to keep everyone employed and turn it around and grow it. Uh, it's a very different mindset in much of private equity, not all, but much. Yeah. And I think that's where the, that private equity gets the reputation for being vulture capitalism. And it kind of gets back to what I was talking about before, the difference between a founder and an owner, you know, there's two yeah. completely different objectives. Um, I think, I think Toys R Us uh, off the top of my head was an example of a company that was, you know, basically allowed to fail. Um, you know, I mean, the bonds were trading at par before it went under. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's absolutely true. Running a business isn't exactly easy. So if, if, if you don't have the, the expertise in general, which I think a lot of private equity does have, but then if you don't on top of that, have the industry expertise, uh, you just, you just treat every company the same and it doesn't, it doesn't work. It, it's, it, it goes to one of the things I've seen you write about, which is that it's such a sexy corner of finance. And, and it seems like there's just riches, like it's easy. It seems easy that <laughs> everybody's getting into it now. Can you talk a little bit about that? Cause you're like, you're the king of sentiment, right? Yeah. And, and where is sentiment with regard to private equity? Uh, that's pretty much where it is. It's a, uh, it's a magic money machine, you know? <laughs> And we can kind of go back in history and look at things that were like a magic money machine and see what happened over time. Um, You know, my definition of a bubble is when people are making money out of proportion to their intelligence and work ethic. Um, And look, like with 17,000 private equity firms, there's a lot of marginal players. Like, you know, ultimately... um, you know, one of the remedies for this, which we'll talk about in a bit, is to short the private equity firms, the publicly traded ones. But like I said, there's only a handful of them. And to be honest, you know, those are the ones that are probably the best positioned for an industry downturn. Um, if there was a way to short a basket of, you know, the small private equity firms, the sub billion AUM ones, like that would really be interesting. Um, but unfortunately, it just doesn't exist. So. I think you sent me a text once of a, of a uh, picture of Kim Kardashian um, starting a private equity group. Yeah, Kim Kardashian. I mean, she's not even the best example because, 
like she's actually pretty smart and, and she sort of knows what she's doing. Um, probably one I, of the best marketers in, in the country. Uh, yeah. You so, know, so like, so that's not the best example. The best example is a guy named Caleb Williams, who was a, is a 23 year old, um, quarterback for what team I forget, maybe the Browns. And, um, he started a private equity firm called A A A Midas. So, <laughs> twenty-three year old football player starting a private equity firm called Midas. It's yeah. just uh, it's that easy. Yeah, you see this. You see this in every cycle. You know, and the thing about private equity is, like, it is a bubble. It is absolutely a bubble. It's one of the biggest bubbles of all time, but. It's hard to communicate that to people because it is opaque, right? And a lot of people don't, I mean, look, I had to explain what it is at the beginning of this call. Like a lot of people don't know what it is and, but it is, it is absolutely a bubble. So why is it, why is it a bubble? Is it because they're buying uh, companies that make smoothies, uh, you know, smoothie stands and, and car washes and, you know, I have a friend who uh, five or six years ago, he's a funeral director and he had two funeral homes in tiny little towns in rural Vermont. And he was taken out by a private equity group. I mean, how does this make sense? You know, the funny thing is, is that um, a funeral home is actually a pretty good business to buy. <laughs> but for a private equity group? Well, actually, I take that back. I, I just want to talk about funeral homes for a second. Because <laughs> okay. People are dying that, to get in there. That, it, it's a grave situation. <laughs> <laughs> there's, uh, there's actually, like, that's a risky business. And somebody was telling me, I had somebody told me they bought um, a cemetery REIT, right? Wow. Uh, they bought a REIT that owns cemeteries and uh, it, it, it turned out to be a complete disaster because over the last 10 or 15 years, everybody is getting cremated. It used to be that 80% of people were just buried and now like 80% of people are cremated and this guy lost his ass on the cemetery REIT, right? So there is... There is, you would think that a funeral home has a pretty stable, you know, conservative business. There is risk in everything. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. And when you're bidding prices up, so, so private equity groups, part of how they make their money, if I understand it right, is they charge fees on assets under management. Yep. So if they have a bunch of cash that they haven't deployed, they can't charge fees on it. Yep. And there's just two, when you add them all together, there's just more money than, than, than can possibly be put into the private market at this point, it seems like without raising prices. Yeah. I mean, there's just, there's not really any good deals left and there's a huge amount of competition for these deals and the valuations are going up. And one of the things that I like to talk about with private equity is a lot of this is driven by the the, the demand side, Right. It's driven by the LPs. It's driven by the endowments and the pension funds and the family offices because they have cash they want to put to work. And like they do, they basically say, okay, we have 20% of our portfolio that's going towards private equity, whereas that used to be zero, but now it's 20 or 30%. And that money goes to private equity no matter what. And they talk about dry powder in the private equity industry. Like it's, I think there's like 700 billion of dry powder that hasn't been put to work yet. You know, it's just an enormous amount of money. Yeah. And if you don't put it to work, if you don't invest it, you have to give it back yep. at some point. And that's a no, no. Yep. So yeah, it's not a good situation. How do rising interest rates or higher, higher interest rates than what we've had for the past 15 or so years, how does that play into all this? Well, that's actually a big deal because a lot of these deals that were getting done five years ago in 2019, you know, interest rates were super low back then. So, you know, with Fed funds at zero, these private equity firms were borrowing at like two and a half percent. And now they're in a position in 2024 where they have to refinance that debt at eight percent. Right. That's, you know, that's a big deal. Yeah. 
Anybody can do the math. Anyone looking at buying a house right now and and calculating how their mortgage payment would change with a seven percent mortgage rate is 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 well aware of the impact of of mortgage on a payment. Yeah. Or I'm sorry, of interest on a payment. So you you put together an unbelievable presentation where you really make the case really well in, in, in an expose of private equity. It was like a 30 page document. I'm going to have a link to that, um, to, to that research that you did in the description, because I think anyone who's interested in this discussion and this topic really should read it. Jared, I want to, I want to pick your brain on, on if you see any parallels, cause I see parallels between where we're at now and everything that you've talked about with private equity and where things were back in like 2006 before the great financial crisis, before the economy melted down because uh, the the housing market collapsed and the mortgage industry blew up. Um, In 2006, very few people, there were some, but very few people were, were talking about that as a risk. Stock market was going up. People were making money. Everyone felt great. Um, and then most people got blindsided uh, in 2008, 2009. Stock market collapsed. People lost jobs. Millions of people lost their jobs. Businesses closed. Um, economy went into a deep recession. The, 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 the financial system almost melted down globally. I mean, it was bad, right? But, but in 2006, nobody really saw that coming uh, or, or very few people. And I'm curious if you think that today is sort of the equivalent to 2006 with private equity. In both cases, risk appetite is enormous, right? We have huge amounts of risk appetite. Interest rates are also high. Liquidity is abundant. Um, you know, up until this recent bout of volatility in the stock market, we had an extremely low volatility environment. There's a lot of things in common between 06 and 24. Um, I will say that I think in 2006, um, more people were aware of the problem than they are with private equity today. Like in 2006, um, there were, you know, there were signs everywhere. There were housing developments that were empty. They were being built in the middle of nowhere. Uh, you had, um, you know, these sleazy real estate agents on the cover of Fortune magazine with a cell phone up to their head. Like it was just like it was pretty obvious that there was a bubble. I don't think it's as obvious today. I mean, I think if you're in the financial world and you're on Twitter and you see what I post all the time, then it's probably Like you probably have an inkling that there's a bubble, but I don't think it's common knowledge yet. I think it was common knowledge in 2006, which leads me to believe that we're still probably a bit early. So you're you're very financially savvy and long career on Wall Street. Um, And and I think you saw some of what was happening. Didn't you (laughs) didn't you go to look at a condo in 2006 in Miami and the real estate agent was taking a nap? In the guest oh, bedroom. it was in uh, Hermosa Beach, California. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> the guy was asleep, the guy was asleep on the bed. Yeah, <laughs> that, ding ding ding. Top. Like, that's when people are making money all out of proportion to their intelligence and work <laughs> work ethic. That's a bubble. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of true with private equity too. Like I know some private equity people, and you know they're they're fine. They're nice people, but I, they're not. I don't want to say they're masters of the universe. You know, I don't want to say that they should be making 500 grand at the age of 26, you know, and by the way, you know, I kind of, I was, when I was working on wall street, I was the beneficiary of one of those bubbles, like the two thousands, in addition to being the real estate bubble was also the hedge fund bubble. There was like 15,000 different hedge funds. The trading business was enormous. You know, I was 30 years old getting paid almost a million dollars a year. Like that, that was transitory. Like that, that did not last. Right. And this isn't going to last either. So the other cool thing about that whole period that, you know, and Michael Lewis outlined it really well in in his book, the big short, and there was a movie called the big short based on the book, but you had guys like Steve Eisman and, and, and Michael Burry who made fortunes. They, they made absolute fortunes by seeing what was coming, figuring out how to invest in it, 
doing it early and then just being patient and waiting. Uh, do you think that that opportunity exists now? Yes, I do. And I want to say it's very, very similar because if you remember, you know, if you watch the movie or read the book, um, Steve Eisman, Michael Burry, they put these trades on and the housing market started to collapse and they didn't make any money. Right. You remember that? Yes. Like they didn't make any money because the banks kept marking their bonds in the same place. Right. And they were, they were furious. They're like, how can you mark the bonds here? But the banks could mark the bonds wherever they wanted to. It's the same thing with private equity. Let's say we get just a stupid example, but let's say we get a, a hypothetical example. Stock market goes down 50%, right? The S and P is down 50%. Well, private equity should be marking down their portfolios, but they won't. They can't. They can't. So it's the same exact scenario. So it is, go it, however long you think this is going to take to play out, it is going to take even longer because they will not mark down their portfolios until they absolutely have to. So those investors, the, the Eismans and, and the Burries of the world that were featured in the movie, they, they made their money by putting on these exotic trades using using derivatives and tools that an individual investor is not going to be able to avail themselves of right like like credit default swaps um stuff that no one had ever heard of before unless you were you were a structured finance guy on wall street is this the same type of situation for for an investor who knows about the risks of private equity can can they put this on can an individual put it on i mean the answer is yes you can you are limited to listed securities, right? So the publicly, tri publicly traded private equity firms, uh, you can trade options on them, right? Which comes in handy. Um, and there might be some derivative plays, which I haven't really figured out yet. Like I'm kind of in search of derivative plays on this. Um, there might be some, but the answer is yes. As a, as a individual investor, you, you can play this. So and, and how do you think about this in terms of size? Like, it, like, like a guy like Michael Burry, right? Like he, I didn't see his book, but I'm assuming he, a big percentage of his fund was invested in the idea of real estate collapsing. Is that how you're looking at this? Or is this a risk a little to make a lot type, type opportunity? It all depends how you structure it. Um, it's, I, the, the nice thing about private equity is that I think the distribution is not normal. Um, I don't think private equity has a lot of upside from here. Let's put it that way. Um, you know, I've been short one of the stocks for eight months and I'm down like 5% on it. Like there's, there's just, there's not much in the way of upside, um, which enables you to size it a little bit bigger. You can size it bigger than you normally would, right? And if you're running a long short portfolio, if your longs are going up and your shorts are staying unch, then you're pretty happy. You know, then that's actually that's actually a win. I've heard you say many times and right before the uh, market correction that we had a few weeks ago, you you told your uh, your street freak readers to to buy some some puts uh, on the S and P five hundred uh, because your logic was look things are looking a little copy and you need to buy insurance when you can not not when you need it because when you need it it's too late yep is this a similar situation where you do it now while you can and then you wait well that's i think that's true of all situations i think that's true of any time you're going to put on a short the thing is is that these stocks do pay dividends so there is some negative carry um if you're buying puts then you know if there's there's a clock ticking, so if the stocks don't go down, you're losing money. Basically, this is it's the same situation with any short. You're like, how do I be short and pay as little as a little amount of carry as possible? Right, like that's the challenge. You remember in 2014 when I was shorting the Canadian banks, right? Yes, I do. Okay, so I was short CIBC for like five or six years. And, um, over five or six years, the stock was unch. Like I actually broke even, but I paid $250,000 in dividends. Right. So, <laughs> so <laughs> that's, that is, 
you know, there's a cost associated with being short, right? Like there's the, you have to pay the carry. So if I recall you and that, that, that short, the Canadian housing trade ended up being profitable for you overall. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. So even though you didn't get the, uh, the spectacular meltdown that you, I think were, were thinking might happen, you made money on the idea because yeah. you know, knew how to do it. Yep. That's kind of really what I want to get to to wrap this up is, you know, if, if you're a Wall Street trader, if you're a market participant uh, listening to this conversation, you're intrigued by the idea, you see all the sort of, sort of same things that Jared sees, well, you probably know what to do. Or you have a research shop that you can go to and say, look at this. Um, for an individual investor or, or somebody who doesn't have access to that level of research, this is what you do, right? In Street Freak, like you are, you are going to hold people's hands and tell them, this is exactly what you need to do. Here's how you do it. If you've never done a short, here's how you do it. If you've never bought an option, here's how you buy it. Here's which one you buy. You, you'll do all of that for them and help them put this idea to work. Correct? Yep. Yep. Yeah. For sure. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Cool. So we'll, we'll make sure that we get anyone who's interested more information on street free. Cause you've got a special offer coming uh, and you're orienting that letter around this big short 2.0 idea, which I think is, is spectacular. Um, it's about time more people start making money on wall street shenanigans uh, instead of getting rinsed by it. Well, the, I mean, the other thing I'll add is, you know, in street free, there's a portfolio, right? And there's a, there's a bunch of longs and there's a bunch of shorts and the portfolio is done very well. Like, you know, we know the returns it's done very well. Um, I think that, I think that short private equity is a good trade on a standalone basis. Right. But I think it's an even better trade in the context of a bigger portfolio because of the, 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 the risk characteristics of those private equity firms. So that's, that's one of the reasons why I like it so much. Right. It's, it's just, it, it, it's just the, it's the perfect hedge to a portfolio. Before we go, I just got to ask you, I mean, you were, you were on wall street. You were at Lehman brothers, not just on wall street, but at Lehman brothers during the financial crisis. Ooh, hopefully I don't trigger bad memories for you, but like what we, you had nothing to do with the real estate department. You were head of the ETF desk and you grew that desk to be one of the biggest on wall street while you were there. Um, what was it like? What was it like for you, um, you on both the good side and the bad side? Well, I can tell you that, you know, I knew that Lehman was going to go bankrupt, not just me, but everybody at the firm. We knew there was a problem. Um, the stock topped out in the summer of 07. And then it just had the ugliest chart of any stock in history. It could not get an uptick. Literally, the stock could not get an uptick for like a year and a half. Um, and in the summer, in the summer of 08, uh, my wife was in Kenya doing research and the stock was trading around like 15 or 20 bucks. And I was like, we are, we are definitely going bankrupt. Um, and she got off the plane when she came home and I'm like, I'm going to need to find a job. <laughs> so that was like in July of 08, you know, so it was, like we, we knew it was going to happen. And then there was all this stuff like Dick Fold was trying to sell the firm to like the Korean development bank and like all this crazy stuff. And, uh, it, the writing, I, I, I pretty much knew for about three to six months that, that it was, it was going to be over. So. Okay. And, and did, did you see any of this sort of Michael Burry side of things? Our client base was predominantly hedge funds. And, you know, we would go out for drinks with them and they would tell us to our face, they're like, you guys are going bankrupt. Like it's happening. And they wouldn't short Lehman at Lehman because we were restricted in Lehman. We couldn't trade Lehman, but they would short Lehman at Morgan Stanley. And then we would hear from people at Morgan Stanley that they were shorting our stock. So your customers, our customers. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was a very, it was a very consensus short, like, like all the hedge funds were short Lehman. Um, and I got to say, it was one of the few shorts that actually went to zero. Most shorts don't go to zero, 
right? Like they go now 90% and they stop and then there's a squeeze and everybody gets sconed. Like Beyond Meat, most recently, everybody thought Beyond Meat was going out of business and they burned a bunch of short sellers. GameStop, like companies don't go to zero, but Lehman was the one that went to zero and like all these short sellers got paid off. So you got to know when to get out in general. Yeah, in general. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm excited about this idea. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've had the good fortune of working with a lot of private equity folks uh, over the course of my career. I've interviewed some, David Rubenstein. Um, you know, there are some fantastic people in private equities. They're, they're not all bad. It's just that the industry as a whole has gotten too big, way too big. And, 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 and there's so many distortions now that I think, it's, uh, I think it's a great idea. What do you think is going to set it in motion? That is the part that I don't know. I really have no idea. Um, it, it'll be a surprise. It'll be a surprise. Yeah. Okay. So put the trade on and wait. Yep. All right. Well, we'll get some more information out on Street Freak where you can learn everything, the specific details on how Jared is doing it and do it along uh, with him. Jared, always good to see you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.